Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, our text this morning begins in verse 7. We'll extend to the end of the chapter, verse 21. As we continue to pursue this theme of Christian assurance, how might I know and have confidence that I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, we continue to see these different questions that the text brings up for us to probe our hearts. This morning we... We have a question that's similar to one that we've seen elsewhere, but yet different. Do you know God's love? As we're going to see as we read the text together, there's much here about loving one another. And yet this horizontal uh, imperative, this command to love one another, uh, only will happen. It only works when it's rooted in the vertical. And indeed in this grand indicative of God's great love for us in Jesus Christ. And so the question then, do you know God's love, is important, it's vital. Uh, And not simply knowing in terms of some kind of propositional way of knowing, but a deep experiential confidence, yes, I know that God loves me. That's the question for us this morning. But to hear it, not just with our ears, but with our hearts, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask him for it, shall we? Would you pray with me? Almighty God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we do come and we ask that you would enter into this space and accompany the reading of your word so that our eyes of faith might be opened, indeed the very ears of our hearts might hear the word of God and be changed and transformed. Above all, Lord, do your work in such a way that not a person will leave this place without a grand certainty deep in their inner being of your great love for them. Lord, please do your work, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 John chapter 4, then, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He had been horribly abused for over two and a half years in the Japanese prison camp. The former Olympian's body had wasted away to skin and bones. His mind was filled with bitterness and anger. He had been tortured and beaten. And all he really wanted to do 
was to kill the prison camp commander, who was known simply as the bird. And yet, fast forward 40 years later, he had wanted to find the former prison camp commander, not to kill him, but in order to forgive him. And not just to forgive him in his heart, but to forgive him verbally and face to face. He wanted to share the word of God with the bird, with this man who had sadistically tortured him and beat him. Many of you know that story from Laura Hildebrand's book, Unbroken. And yet the question is why? How? In what possible universe does it make sense for Louis Zamperini to try to find the bird in order to forgive him, in order for him to know the love of God in Jesus Christ. Well, it only makes sense. We can only get our heads around it, and that not quite well, when we come to realize that Louis Zamperini had come to know the love of God in Jesus Christ. His life had been completely changed, completely transformed when he came to Jesus Christ. He had come to know the love of God, not simply as an intellectual truth, but something profoundly experienced, an overwhelming reality in his heart. So much so that he was determined to share that love and to share that forgiveness even with his own worst enemy. I ask you this morning, what kind of love does that? Only the love of God displayed in Jesus Christ. Only the love of God that springs from God's own nature. Only the love of God that brings about real consequences in our lives. John tells us here that if we desire to have confidence, if we desire to have genuine assurance, then we need to answer this question. Do you know God's love? No, not just intellectually, but experientially. No, not just in your head, but deep down in your heart and in your bones so that it actually changes the way you live. I ask you this morning, do you know? Do you really know God's love? Well, how's that possible? How's it possible to know in this deep and real experiential sense, a sense that changes us from the inside out. How is it possible to know that love? Well, in order to grasp it, in order to know God's love, we first have to see the character of God's love. John tells us from the very first verse in this section that love is from God. You see it? Beloved, let us love one another, verse 7, for love is from God. The very basis of our loving another is rooted in this prior reality that that any love, whether it's genuine love for another in a common grace, general operations way of this way, any love that we have, we first learn because love is from God. John's already mentioned this in chapter 2, verse 10, and chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. But here again, he comes to tell us If we're going to know love and we're going to love one another, we have to step back and recognize the love of God. Well, how how can we know it? How can we recognize it? How can we plumb its character? We see first that, that God's love is his own being. It's his own essence. If you were to try to get to the very essence of who God is, John tells you twice, God is love. Did you see it? John Four, verse 8, 1 John 4, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Again, verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. So what does that mean? What does it mean when we say that God is love? Well, it means that at the very center of God's own being, at the very essence of who God is in this relationship of Father, Son, Spirit, is love and delight. There's never been a moment in all eternity, if you could stretch beyond time into eternity past, there's never been a moment in time where the Father did not love the Son. 
And the Son did not love the Father. And this love that the Father and Son had for one another that is the Holy Spirit wasn't the reality of God's own self. This Trinitarian reality. There's never a moment in time where that wasn't the case. And so it is that God's own being, his own essence, is to be infinitely, eternally, and unchangeably love. Or as C.S. Lewis put it in Mere Christianity, Christians believe that the living, dynamic activity of love has been going on in God forever and ever and ever and has created everything else. You see, God's own love for himself, the Father's love for the Son, the Son's love for the Father, the Spirit that is the love of God itself, it didn't remain within God's own self. It didn't remain private and contained. No, it spilled out. It was public. God's love, who is his essence, it moved to action. It moved to acting. John says in verse 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us. God's love didn't remain private. It became public. It was made manifest. It was displayed. It was placarded. It was put on a billboard so that all could see it. God's own creatures, God's own people could know it. The character of God's love was displayed in his acting how? Well, three ways. First, God's love is, was displayed in sending. So verse 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Perhaps you've had this mental image of God the Father as though God the Father is this harsh, distant deity who, who dwells up in the heavenly courtroom and has the great ledger where he keeps all of your sin and all of your sinning and his face is in a perpetual scowl and he's harsh and vindictive and and Jesus is actually going to somehow persuade the father who's unwilling to forgive to somehow forgive you because because of what Jesus no if you think that no that's not at all the picture that the Bible presents concerning God the father no from one end of the Bible to the to the other end of the Bible the picture that God's word gives us of the of the attitude of God the Father towards you is that God the Father loves you. We should never attribute anything less than infinite, eternal, and unchangeable love to God the Father. How do we know that God the Father loves you? He sent his only son. He sent the, the son of his own love. The one and only, the choice one, the one with, with whom he had been in eternal relationship. He sent him. Why? So that you might live. So that you might live. He first created you in Adam and Eve. Adam, the son of God. He first created you. And yet in humanity from Adam's time to our own time, we have been rebels against this father. We've taken up arms against him. We've protested. We've sought to go our own way. We've run as fast as we could the other way away from the father. And yet what did the father do? The father pursued you. He sent his son to run after you. So that he might rescue you from you. So that you might have life. Not just life that goes on and on and on, but real life. Life from the age to come. Abundant, transformative life. That's what the Father has done. That's how much the Father loves you. If you want to see God's love in action, you can just stop with God so loved the world he gave. He sent. And yet that's not all. God shows his love not only in sending, God's love is actually displayed also in sacrifice. You see it in verse 10, and this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. You see, we think we know what love is, but love's not displayed ultimately in our love for God. Love is not known in our sacrifice, in our endeavors, in our obedience. No, we get a taste of it. We get a picture of it. It's, it's a response to, but that's not the ultimate picture of what love is. How do we know, where do we go in order to see what love is? We go to the cross. 
In this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation. This particular Greek word that our ESV translates propitiation, it's used only twice, 1 John 2, 2, here in 1 John 4, 10. And it pictures, as the NIV has it, an atoning sacrifice. The guilt that is ours, not just because of our sinning, but because of the twistedness on the inside. This dirtiness, this filthiness, this heaviness that is ours. Not just because we commit sins, but because we are sinners. Jesus Christ was sent. He came willingly so that he might die on the cross as the atoning sacrifice to wash you clean. And why did he do that? Because he had to. Was he somehow grudging in doing that? Oh, Father, do I really have to do this? Are you really making me go to earth to die for those sinners? To be a sacrifice? Really? No. He didn't come because he had to. He came because he wanted to. Because of his great love for you. He was willing to be the sacrifice. He was willing to be the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation for your sins. Because of his great, great love for you. So friends, when you want to see the love of God displayed, you see it in his acting, in the Father sending the Son. You see it in his acting, in the Son being willing to be the sacrifice. But you also see it in his substituting. Because the verse goes on. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus didn't die for his sins. He was the sinless Savior. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted and tried by the devil himself. He triumphed over the devil at each point, and he fulfilled his mission. So Jesus wasn't a sacrifice for his sin. No, he was, a, he was sent as a sacrifice and a substitute for you. The cross that had written on it Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, that sign should have had your name on it. They should have said, Sean Lucas, Chief of Sinners, and every one of you besides. Your name should have been there. But it wasn't. Why? Because of the great love that the Father had, and the Son had, and the Spirit had for you. That Jesus came as a substitute and took your place on the cross. He did it because in all, before all eternity, before time began, Father, Son, and Spirit confederated together that this would be the most excellent way of salvation. This would be the way that would bring God most glory. This would be the way to shine the light on his infinite, eternal, and unchangeable love that he would send Jesus to die as a sacrifice and a substitute for you. So friend, if you're here today and you are doubting and wondering concerning whether you are loved, doubting and wondering whether in fact God loves you. Look at the cross and see there at the cross the great evidence that the Father, Son, and Spirit, the triune God, love you. They love you. Do you know that love? Not just in your head. Do you know God's love for you in your bones? Can you sing how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make this wretch a treasure? Can you sing it not just with your head, but with your heart? Do you know it? If not, there's good news. I've got good news for you this morning. God offers you this love today, right now, free of charge. And all you have to do is open your hands and open your heart to receive it. To lay down your weapons, to lay down your rebellion, to lay down your obstinance and your opposition, to stop running and receive it and rest in it and revel in the fact that God loves you. In Jesus Christ, God loves you. And if you will, and if you do, what you'll see is that 
when we come to know this love of God, it changes us. There are consequences of knowing God's love. In fact, there's, there's three that John mentions here in our text. And, and the most obvious when you read the text is that because we com- have come to know the love of God in Jesus Christ, because God's love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, one of the consequences is we love one another. You see it in verse 11. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then at the end of the section, in verses 20 and 21, he says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have for him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. It's the main thing he's arguing in this section. But the thing you have to notice is that this consequence is rooted in prior reality. The, the duty is actually rooted in a prior truth. What we are to do is actually rooted in what is true. What we're to do is to love one another. That's the consequence. But the great reality is that you've been loved. You've been loved by a love that will not let you go, by a love that's been displayed on a cross, a cross that was yours, that belonged to you. And so because that is true, the natural consequence is that you should and ought to love another and love one another. That's the constant note from this section. Verse 7, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God, knows God. And of course, verse 19, we love, why? Because he first loved us. That's why it's important to ask yourself, do I know God's love? Because if you do, you'll be able to see this evidence, the evidence of of loving one another, starting with your family, yes, but extending out to this congregation and others. Do you love one another? But there's another consequence that we would abide in him. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So we've come to trust in God's love. We've come to know God's love in the sending and the sacrifice and the substitution of Jesus Christ for us. And because that's the case, because we've come to know this love, we've we've been brought together with this God been united to Jesus by the Spirit, and we abide in him and remain in him and he in us. What does that mean? What does that even look like? Well, yesterday, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I was right here in the midst of a beautiful wedding. And Preston and Allie Battle were married, uh, and it was wonderful. After months and months of falling in love and knowing that they loved one another and that that Preston loved Allie and Allie loved Preston. There was a a consequence that came from that, namely that they would be united together. They would make promises. They would be married. But it wasn't just a one-night thing and then they just go on their own merry way, right? No. No, genuine love seeks union but also seeks abiding communion. And so the vows were meant to last till death do us part. That's what we promise when we get married, right? And yet how much more Is that the case with our relationship with this God who's come to us in Jesus Christ? As we've come to love him, but even more as we've come to know his great love for us, we desire to give ourselves to him. And when we rest upon him and receive him as he's offered to us in the gospel, the spirit creates a wedding. There's a union that happens between us and Jesus. But it's not just a one-night stand. No, 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 no. When we've been united to Jesus, we can we continue in relationship with him. We abide in him. We remain in him. That's a consequence of this love. And we only come to know this abiding. We only come to know this relationship as we come to know the truth as it is in Jesus. There's this beautiful interplay in verses 14, 15, and 16 between doctrine and experience. That that the experience of relationship is rooted in truth concerning this God we've come to know in Jesus Christ. And so you see in verse 14, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. What is that? Well, that's doctrine. And then again, verse 15, 
Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, what's that? Again, that's, that's doctrine. Jesus is the Son of God. But then what? Well, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. What's that? That's experience. Don't you see? We're only going to know the experience of, of abiding in Christ in relationship with him in a lifetime marriage relationship with this God who's come to us in Jesus Christ as we know the truth about him. But we can't divorce the two. If you only have truth but no relationship, you have nothing. And if you only have relationship ungrounded in the truth, you might have the flights of fancy, but you might not know fully who it is you have relationship with. But to abide in him brings together both truth and grace, both doctrine and experience, John tells us. It's a consequence of coming to know this love of God. But there's a final consequence here. Not only that we would love one another and we would abide in him, but also we would not fear judgment. You see it in verse 17. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. So for God's love to do its complete work, for it to come to perfection, it will result in this consequence. Namely, we will not fear judgment day. Listen, when you come to your dying day and you go to stand before the God who is the true judge of the world, and you're standing in that heavenly courtroom, this courtroom you feared perhaps so much of your life, you don't have to fear that day. Why? Well, it's because of what John was, goes on to say. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Verse 17. What does that mean? That means what's true of Jesus is true of you. Because you have been united to him, because you have come to rest in him and receive him as he's offered to you in the gospel, because you've come into relationship with this God who's come to you in Jesus Christ, what's true of him is true of you. Jesus is righteous, so are you. Jesus is holy, so are you. Jesus is the beloved Son of the Father, so are you. Jesus is glorious, guess what? So are you. So that when you come to Judgment Day, having come to know this God who sent his Son as a substitutionary sacrifice for you, and you have come into relationship with him so that you're united to him and you have, you're abiding in him. You have a continuing relationship with him. When you come to that judgment day, there's no fear because the judge will look at you and say, Oh, child, you're righteous. You're holy. You're glorious and beautiful. Enter into your wrath. How's that possible? Not because of what lies within you, but because of your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you. Don't you see? Don't you see how amazing this love of God in Jesus Christ is? We sang of it already. That first hymn text we sang, the processional hymn, was by a great 19th century pastor and poet, Horatius Bonar. I feel this strange special connection with him. We share a birthday. He was born on December 19th, so was I, hint, hint. And Bonar served in Leith and Kelso before eventually serving for over 20 years in Edinburgh. Wrote many, many poems and hymn texts. When you flip to the back of your Trinity hymnal, you'll find several in our hymnal. But the hymn we sang this morning has, has always been a favorite. And I think it's a favorite of all true children of God. It was sung at, uh, and played at Ronald Reagan's state funeral in 2004. Why is it a favorite? Because it speaks so truly of the love of God in Jesus Christ. Not some kind of free-floating, amorphous, God is love, love is God, yada, yada, yada. No, no, no. But a real, genuine, rooted, and grounded love in the, in the sacrifice of Jesus as a substitution for you and me. Did you hear what you sang? Oh, love of God, how strong and true, eternal, and yet ever new, uncomprehended and unbought, Beyond all knowledge and all thought, a love of God, how deep and great, far deeper than man's deepest hate. Self-fed, self-kindled like the light, changeless, eternal, infinite. We read you best in him who came to bear for us the cross of shame. Sent by the Father from on high, our life to live, our death 
to die. We read your power to bless and save, even in the darkness of the grave. Still more in resurrection light. We read the fullness of your might. Do you read the love of God in the story of Jesus Christ? Do, the, do you read and know the love of God for you in what God has done in and through Jesus? That the Father would send the Son. That the Son would come willingly, joyfully to rescue you from you. That he would be the sacrifice for your sins, your substitute. Have you rested in him? Do you know him? Do you know this love? The very love of God. Do you? Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, Father, Son, Spirit, we do pray that you would give us just a taste just a taste of your goodness that we might revel and rejoice in your great love for us. Lord, I pray for my friends here. I pray that not a single one would leave doubting, fearful, wondering. They would run to the cross and see once again your great love for us. That is the power of the cross. That Christ would become sin. He would bear our shame. And we would change us from the inside out. That's, that's how much you love us. And so, Lord, persuade us yet again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.